Hello friends and welcome to episode 6 of our Rome Total War Divide at Impera Recaps. This was a turbulent episode with plenty of back and forth between us and our newfound enemies on the fronts. We started with a clear image of what we wanted to do in mind, a united Arabian Peninsula under our banner. Initial success on our part had now ground to a halt as the desert attrition in and around Arabia Magna was so severe that we were struggling to match an army south without it being depleted heavily. A plan was eventually hatched to attack Chatra Matites' last holdings from the sea, they will now be referred to as Chatra, then using this settlement as a staging ground. The council had also made grand plans for Medewe, and we had forces in place on the border to launch an attack at a moment's notice. However, before we could go on the offensive, Gerea attacked our severely damaged and depleted forces now garrisoned in the Athrib that had previously fought and defeated multiple armies in the surrounding deserts. The stakes were high, and a lot hinged on this battle. We had limited cavalry numbers and only really fielded some depleted elephants and Sarissa lancers. Our strength here was our number of infantry. We would attempt to lure the enemy into the large open square where their numbers held no advantage and then surround them, cutting them down. Our expertly placed spike pits and traps destroyed their initial attempts to skirmish us with their cavalry, however this only bought us time. The left flank was where the initial clashes took place. Our local plebs, loyal to our king, took to the field charging wildly at the enemy while our levy units threw projectiles overhead. The plan was to sucker them into a melee and then bring the anvil down in the form of our elephants and lancers. This immediately yielded results and we circled around and attempted to engage the enemy's centre that was now locked in a melee in the town square. Meanwhile, the enemy still attempted to skirmish our centre and back lines from our flanks. Our general Simonocles, who commanded the bloodied band, decided that he would take care of these enemies on his own, and ran through multiple groups of them, truly leading by example. As our front line began its engagement, it held firm and would have to do so for the duration of the battle. Our flanking forces would now be making their moves. The first attempt was not our most successful endeavour. Multiple enemy units did rout, however we lost our plebs and one of our levy units, and our cavalry did not get an appropriate window to engage the enemies their hybrid archer spear units proving to be quite the challenge. With the grand square of the town turning into a mass of bodies and metal, the opportunity for the right flank to fold was now. If we could bring our flanks to bear before our left was routed, this fight was undoubtedly winnable. The enemy had largely committed their forces and our cavalry units were in position, our elephants primed and ready. With a number of elephant charges and a relentless barrage of fire arrows, the enemy were close to breaking point. Then came what I will call the White Wave. The entirety of the enemy's units just threw up their white flags and began clamouring over one another in an attempt to flee the mass of bodies. The three had been defended and the enemy's attempts to take it had been thwarted, the bloodied band once again revelling in another victory. However, no one could say the Arabian tribes were not stubborn. While we were toasting our victory in the west, enemy forces defending Marib sallied out from the siege. An earlier engagement suited us here as we were suffering terribly in the desert heat and weather. We outclassed the enemy in terms of quality and were not too concerned at what they were fielding. Our one issue was, again, the vast desert and how open it was. The enemy seemed to just appear from nowhere on the back of their camels. We took the decision to deploy in depth and plan to lure the enemies into our pikes, pin them in and then move our levy units through the gaps we had left to begin cutting them down while our cavalry flanked. This worked perfectly and allowed our entire front line to be brought down upon the enemy simultaneously while our cavalry did the legwork on the flanks, hitting and running time and time again. With the enemy's numbers being constantly depleted, we began using our pike wall as a defensive point, hitting with our cavalry, then retreating around our pikes while our levies protected our flanks. The entire time the enemy were in the field in front of our formation, our vast number of slingers and archers were raining down death. Before we knew it, the enemy were breaking, and all that was left to do was the casual sprinkling of war crimes as we ran them down. And with that, Marib was in our hands, a great success in our attempts to take the peninsula. However, the desert conditions here made maintaining an army incredibly difficult, as we were about to find out. With hostilities against the Arabs coming to a head, Medewe were not to be trusted, and after lengthy discussions, the council decided that we should act first and seize the initiative. However, they vastly outnumbered us on the Ethiopian front. A new army would be raised, consisting mainly of support troops and cavalry to help us in our engagements to come. 
Next on the agenda, as decided by the council, was the pirates, that had once again appeared off of the coast of Side. A fleet of fireport ships had been raised and were being sent to remove the nuisance from our coast. We were outnumbered but had the pots at our disposal. We arranged our fleet in a singular line and engaged the enemies across the board at the exact same moment. We decisively won the initial rams and were then left mopping up the leftovers of the defeated pirates. If they did not go down with their ships, they were thrown overboard as prisoners. With a second pirate fleet vanquished in as many years, we began asking the question of why they keep returning here. They've been slaughtered twice, surely we would not see them here again. Then, the largest battle we had faced since the beginning of this campaign started. 6,000 Seleucid versus 12,500 Medewe warriors. We were on the offensive here, and were not quite as prepared as we would have liked to have been. Our main line moved to close the gap with the enemy, while our reinforcing army made a direct course for the enemy's reinforcements. We had an abundance of cavalry, and it was decided we would make use of them from the beginning. It was on the far left flank with our second army that the engagement began. These troops were not of the quality we were used to, and in fact most of them were local mercenaries who had probably fought both for and against us in our victorious Egyptus campaign. The cavalry began manoeuvring, but were constantly being bogged down by the enemy skirmish fire and counter charges. Back at the main engagement, the enemy then boldly, or stupidly depending on how you look at it, charged their elephant straight at our pike walls, with a number of them being brought down by the intensity of our skirmish fire. Obviously a bold manoeuvre. We've killed, we're killing a few of them. Look at that slideshow. Confidence was at an all-time high, and the belief that this would be just another victory began taking grip. We very quickly realised that the enemy, through sheer numbers, was going to be able to simply overwhelm our front lines. They would take a lot of casualties in the process, but our pikes just simply could not stand up to the constant punishment. In hindsight, it was believed that sending our reinforcements to engage the enemy's third army was the nail in our coffin. Had they been able to take part in flanking manoeuvres at the main army, it could have been different. While our main army started showing signs of breaking, our reinforced army began getting the edge. That was until the enemy's second army appeared over the horizon. Before long, our general in command, Cordelian, who was a high-ranking member of the royal court, had to make the decision to charge him with his bodyguard and cavalry, or live to fight another day. The enemy's victory was not going to be total, and we could reform, reorganise, and attempt to counterattack. With pride damaged heavily in Ethiopia, our two armies retreated north, splitting apart and garrisoning one of the settlements each while attempting to reinforce and rearm. We did manage to somewhat prepare our defence, however, our army was still not at full strength. The enemy brought their full might against Diospolis, where our weaker of our two armies was stationed. We could not afford to lose any of the core provinces in Egyptus. After all, this had become our proverbial breadbasket. As we began organising the defence, we realised that this town was in fact not an ideal defensive point, as it had multiple approaches. Alas, we decided to defend as many of them as we can, and then fall back should we be required to do so defensively. If we had only been fighting one army, I think this would have been a walk in the park. However, all three had come crashing down on us at once. The first army attacked us exactly where we wanted them, between two of our front lines. The idea was that we could fold round on them when one of their fronts showed signs of routing. However, these engagements took longer than expected, and with the enemy approaching from a completely different flank, we had to reorganise and shuffle the defence multiple times, which weakened it significantly. Our cavalry began slowly chipping away at the initial front, where most of the fighting had taken place, and over time started to slowly route enemy units there. Meanwhile, our local hoplite units attempted to hold the enemy's other two armies at bay, an epic task to say the least. As our victory on the initial front was becoming complete, we attempted to move large volumes of our hoplite and phalanx units over to the west. Our local hoplites had already overperformed by holding the enemy at bay, but their day was not over yet. Ideally, we would get to rest our professional soldiers before throwing them into the fight. Our archers were also continuing to rain in fire arrows, which was causing masses of damage. However, the enemies were numerous, and they did field a number of their elite archer-spear hybrid units. This was going to be an uphill battle. With the weight from both sides coming to clash at the centre point, our cavalry, now massively diminished, had little left to give, and it became clear that this was a slowly approaching defeat. 
Our brave warriors fought on and attempted to hold, and at multiple moments it looked touch and go. But unfortunately, today was not our day. For the first time in recent memory, we had lost what had become one of our core provinces. The council was outraged. They cried that vengeance had to be swift and complete. The army to the northeast was going to be dispatched immediately to counterattack. As our military morale hit an old time low, our seasons of planning the amphibious attack on Chatra came to a conclusion. We had our army on land attack the town while our fleet approached the harbour. Taking this would close the Red Sea to our trade exclusively, an incredibly lucrative thought. As we approached the town we realised that they were attempting to sally out. We decided that we would rush forward and attempt to bottleneck them in the open ground outside the streets so their numbers could not be used, buying time for our navy to land in the harbour and encircle the enemy fully. Their own streets would be used against them. With our plans in motion, all we had to do was wait for the pieces to fall into place. In no time at all, we had the enemy surrounded in a bottleneck just outside the town and a large marine force assaulted them from their harbour. They had no retreat and were completely cut off. The very streets they looked to use to their advantage, now their demise. It was a plan months in the making that had been executed perfectly. We finished off what remained of the enemy's forces, and much propaganda would be made about this win, in order to try to cushion the damage suffered earlier on the banks of the Nile. Just as we began showing signs of recovery, and prepared our counter-attack against Medewe, Pergamon came knocking. Much discussion had been had about our eventual plans to attack north. No one had really expected that they would in fact be the aggressors. They were in fact attacking one of our satrapies in the form of Parthava. All of our satrapies still remained loyal, and whilst they were under our banner, they would receive our protection. If we were being completely honest, we had one under-equipped army in the north in the form of the Jaws of Jerusalem. They were veterans, but they were outnumbered, cut off, and behind enemy lines. Our economy was going to have to go into overdrive, and armies were going to have to be raised all over our northern domains. On top of the situations developing elsewhere, before we could counterattack Medewe, they in fact attempted to siege us at Myos Hormos. If this settlement fell, all of Egypt and the capital in the region of Alexandria would be under threat. Cordelian planted his standard in the ground and informed his troops that he would be dying here today or toasting victory, and nodded to the gods. This army was not an ideal composition and was largely ragtag, but we had the home ground advantage and dug in for the battle to come. The usual defences were deployed and we choke point the centre of the town, awaiting the enemy advance. On that note, our cavalry contingent was sent forward to harass the enemy on their approach, and had relative success before falling back and reforming. On the other front, our local naval ships rained fire arrows in on the enemies that tried to make their way through our barricades. Our skirmish cavalry on arrival here took the decision to charge into them, slaughtering them as their men attempted to clamber over the barricades. However, it was not long before the real fight began in the crossroads at the centre of town. As always, we planned to sucker the enemy in and then engage them on multiple sides. There was a higher than ever level of resentment in our soldiers, as these were the same warriors they were facing who only a few months ago had routed them from the slaughter to the south and had also destroyed their sister army. As we weakened the enemy's flanks, our trap was sprung and what remained of the enemy's armies from the initial battle were slaughtered to a man leaving no survivors if we could help it. A desperate melee scramble broke out, and our cavalry ran down any man who tried to escape from the mass of bodies. Victory here for us had to be absolute, and it was in fact so absolute that the small enemy garrison left at Diospolis surrendered to us there and then. We had restored the status quo and were in a good position to begin our very own offensive south. And so episode 6 of our recaps draws to a close. We have fought hard to keep what we had this episode, and thanks to some brilliant suggestions by the Council, we have managed to take all of the Arabian Peninsula bar one settlement to the east, which is where we will likely resume next time. The Medewe are firmly in our crosshairs after their attempts at causing complete havoc in Egypt, however Pergamon are now enemy number one. Their treacherous declaration of war is something that will not be forgiven. They have attacked us during a rare moment of defeat, resulting in temporary weakness, and they will be made to pay dearly for that. We will be resuming this playthrough on Monday the 5th of July. These recaps are streamed in their entirety live on my Twitch channel, which is in the description below. I really do love making these for y'all, and hope to continue doing so. 
As always, thank you for the support, feedback, and for just generally being there and making these playthroughs as enjoyable as they have been. I look forward to seeing you for the next one.